Hi everybody, welcome to another Mammoth Site video. Today we're going to be talking about some of our new exhibits and I'm also going to be introducing Dr. Chris Jazz, our head of research. So tell us a little bit about yourself. How'd you come to the Mammoth Site? Uh, well, I have a long history with the Mammoth Site actually. I started uh, my affiliation with the Mammoth Site back in 1991 as a natural history interpreter and ended up going and working with Larry Agenbrod and Jim Mead on a master's degree. Uh, went, uh, did a PhD at the University of Texas at Austin and I've been working as the curator of Ice Age Paleontology at the Royal Alberta Museum for the last 16 years. Uh, Jim Mead recently retired and here I am. Awesome. So as part of your role as our head of research, you're, you kind of you know, oversee a lot of our research projects, participate in a lot of our research projects, and one of the ones we're, you're working on is our cave research. Now, why does the MEM site have a cave exhibit? Why do we do cave research here? Uh, cave research is really important because it tends to house really good records of small animals. So a site like the Mammoth Site has a great record of some of the Ice Age megafauna, and we do get some small animals from the site, but that doesn't tell the whole story of the Ice Age. So sometimes we have to go to different types of sites to find different types of records, and caves are an excellent place to go to to get good records of small animals, small vertebrates, invertebrates, that tell us a lot about you know the past for those animals as well as paleoecology or past ecologies. Awesome. So when we so at this MEM site, obviously we don't have any caves here. Where are some of the caves that we that we study? What are what are some of the caves that we're looking at? And what records are they preserving in particular? Well, we're looking at caves in the Black Hills region. Uh, there's a lot of caves in the Black Hills. Lots of limestone. Anywhere you have limestone, you have the potential to to have caves. And there's two sites in particular that we're looking at. One is in, in Wind Cave National Park, and the other is on Forest Service land. Uh, they're both sites that are late Pleistocene in age, so actually a little bit younger than the Mammoth site. Uh, but they're very different types of sites with very different types of records. So with some of our different caves that we study, we kind of divide our exhibit into wet caves and dry caves. Can you kind of get into the differences to why do we refer to some caves as wet caves and why some caves are considered drier caves? Well, I, I think it's all in the name. Wet caves tend to have more water moving through them. They tend to have more speleothems, stalactites, stalagmites, flowstone. And dry caves may have been wet caves at one time, but now uh, lack a lot of the moisture moving through them and because of the aridity, because of the dryness, you can get really good preservation of bone and even soft tissue uh, in, in some caves, particularly in places like the Great Basin or the American Southwest. You can get very different types of preservation in some of those dry caves. So speaking of dry caves, We've done some research with, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Mead did some research with Great Basin, does Great Basin research, and that's on display here as well. What are some of the fossils that they're finding in those Great Basin caves? Uh, in Great Basin caves, we're finding things like uh, giant ground sloths. Uh, you find a lot of the a lot of the same animals that you find uh, in in wet caves. Things like horses, uh, lots of small mammals, uh, birds. Uh, lizards, I, I would say, in, in some of those caves in the southwest, we certainly have more, more lizards and uh, reptiles than we get in maybe some of the caves here, although even in the caves here, we get some of those animals. We just don't get quite the same diversity. So, it, uh, in general, caves represent things that are li living in local environments. So. Uh, we're getting records of Ice Age megafauna that were living in the Great Basin in those Great Basin caves, and we're getting records of Ice Age faunas that were living in the Black Hills in the caves that we studied in the Black Hills. Awesome. And as part of the, the display, we, I noticed we have a lot of different dung specimens, and from talking with Dr. Mead, it seems that dung comes up a lot in some of those drier caves like where they find almost just layers and layers of different megafauna dung. It, and with that, what is, that preserves extra plants and things as well, right? Absolutely. So, you know, Jim has a long history of working with dung in, in caves in the American Southwest. Uh, he's, he's, well, I, I, won't, I, won't, I, I won't use the word that I want to use, but he's been, he's been working with dung for a long time. 
And yeah, those are, those are amazing records because you can break that done down, you can reconstruct diet, you can identify plant remains that are preserved in that dung, you can look at pollen that's preserved in that dung. They're amazing records that not only tell us about past ecology, but actually give us direct evidence about what those extinct, some of those extinct animals were, were eating, what, what was their diet. Awesome. And with, with looking at the, all that kind of stuff, you know, with dry caves being, you know, mostly, you know, thinking of the caves we're looking at are in the Great Basin. The ones we're looking at here in the Black Hills are more considered accurately considered wet caves, correct? I would say yes. The the caves here tend to tend to at least have some speleothem growth in them. There tends to be a, a, a bit of moisture in them. Uh, definitely not as dry as some of the caves that, that, that Jim and myself have worked in in the, the Great Basin or the American Southwest. And so with the caves that we're working on here in, in the Black Hills, can you get into a, any of like the kind of the specifics of some of the you know, research that's going on with those? Uh, absolutely. So one of, the, one of the sites that we're working on right now has an amazing continuous record from roughly 3,000 years ago and we're back to around 12,000 years ago. Uh, a lot of times in caves, the deposits that we find tend to be mixed because there's a lot of animals that are utilizing those caves and going in and out of those caves. So a lot of times the deposits that we find in caves are mixed. Uh, this particular site that we're working on in the Black Hills actually has in part of the cave a fairly continuous stratigraphic record that right now represents eight, nine, 10,000 years of geologic time. And we think it probably extends back another 10,000 years. So it's a, it's a really unique record in that sense that is going to allow us to look at how life in the Black Hills has changed through a continuous 10 to 20,000 year sequence. Awesome, and so with that it differs you mentioned that it's, it's a unique deposit and like, you know, instead of just being kind of like a snapshot, we have that continuous record. With that, how else does cave paleontology differ from like, you know, say paleontology done at the Mammoth site? What, I guess, you know, do we need different tools? You know, how, what is it, what is the day in the, of the life of a caving paleontologist look like versus one that's doing excavation in like, you know, you know, a more traditional environment? Uh, it really depends on the, the type of cave. Some caves in the Southwest, you can walk up to and walk in. Many of the caves that we're, we're working in in the Black Hills are a little more complex because there's either tight crawls or in, in one case, there's a very vertical component to it. So you actually have to have harnesses and, and vertical gear that allows you to get safely in and out of those cave deposits, which is very different than just walking up to an outcrop and excavating. There's a little more logistical planning that, that needs to go into some of the work that we do in cave deposits. Awesome. And with that, I assume with especially caves that, you know, you know there's still animals actively living in there and cave ecosystems can be pretty uh, sensitive. Do you have to kind of be aware of how your, your excavation is going to potentially impact those environments? Absolutely. So there are certain times of year where we won't go into caves because there are bat populations present. Uh, there are other caves that are hibernacula for snakes. So just for safety reasons, you may not wanna go in there certain times of the year. But absolutely, that's something we're very conscious of. I mean, caves are very sensitive environments. And as researchers who work in caves, we do our very best to minimize any impacts, not only to the cave, but also to the, the animals that call those caves home. Awesome. And to kind of like summarize and kind of wrap it up, what would you say is the coolest part about studying caves in a paleontological concept, context? Sorry. So, what do you enjoy about doing caving, caving paleontology? That you know, is, how does it fit into the bigger picture? I, I think for me, one of the one of the things that I think is really exciting about working in many cave deposits is that caves sometimes occur in mountainous environments. They occur in areas that are inherently erosional. They're one of the few depositional settings that we can go to in those places that, that, that isn't eroding away, that's actually preserving a record. So caves can offer us really unique, unique insight into habitats and environments for which we, we don't really have a great paleontological record otherwise. Awesome. With that, is, but the last thing I want to do is just encourage you guys to, you know, if you're, when you're in the area, visit the site, visit our cave exhibit, take a look around, and feel free to ask us any questions. And with that, we will see you next time.